Uh, my name is Gary Schmidt. Um, I write for middle grade kids, about a dozen novels or so for, for that age group. Um, I write some academic books as well, on children's literature and on uh, New England history. And I teach at Calvin College. I'm Ann Schmidt. I write as Elizabeth Stigman. And obviously we're married. I am sort of a first reader for Gary's books. And I dabble in my own writing. I am working on two novels simultaneously. One of them has to go pretty soon. And I do little picture books and um, poetry. But we've been writing together well, all our married lives for more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. So all writers come upon anxieties and joys and pressures and delights. Because if you are a committed believer, you want every part of your life to be integrated. And so you can't have a writing life that's divorced from your belief. Um, that one informs that's, that's the hardest definition that, <laughs> that can, we always wrestle with. What does that mean to say it's a Christian book? Um, Catherine Patterson talks about not being a Christian writer, but a writer who is a Christian. And I, I like that, that definition or that, that distinction sometimes. I think any book that someone of faith writes, if you're going to be authentic to the book, will show the faith commitments that you hold, whatever faith that you hold. But those things are going to come out in strong and powerful ways, willy nilly. I mean, how can you be authentic and not have that happen? But that's different from writing a book which is meant to be heavily didactic, like let me teach you how to live in this way, or let me deal with this particular topic. And that's your first goal. Um, that's a very different sort of thing. And both of us, I think, are the first rather than the second. I'm a collector of little things. Um, I was at the Pope Museum in Grand Rapids once, and there was a locket that I bought for our daughter and it had on it just a little phrase of a prayer from Jane Austen and it sparked something in me and I wondered what other writers I knew had a prayer life and so I started to um, look for them and I started to write them down and pop them onto the computer um, until about a year later I said to Gary I think we have a collection here and what should we do with it? And it was really a very long process. I would say that it was eight years ago, yeah, even ten long, years ago, that we started doing this. Mm -hmm. And we moved from a focus. At first, the collection was prayers by writers, about anything, really. And we decided that that could be, you know, 17 volumes. And we might needed to have a focus for the book, right? so that the prayers were not just the not, but that they all worked together. And so we decided that we would narrow all of those prayers down to prayers that look at the process of writing. Mm -hmm. like how did these prayers connect to the actual process of the writer working in the world? And so that obviously narrowed quite it down, narrowed down quite a bit. And then from there we decided to go, well, let's take a look at the writer's process, where you start, the first idea, where you end, what are the pressures in between, um, and what prayers we like on what dealt with those issues. And that became the book. Well, it's, it's the movement from, idea, from looking at the world mm -hmm. and being open to what the world has to show you, which is what every writer has to do. I mean, Thoreau talks about being awake to the world around you, and it's, just, it's a different metaphor, but the same idea, it's being open to what the world is going to show. And then moving from there to idea, to putting it down the page, to being blocked at mm -hmm. times, because all writers deal with that at some, at some level, um, to crafting, and then to recrafting and recreating the work and then thinking about how this is going to appear to embody this and find out into the world. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we had sections that we thought we didn't have enough prayers for. And so that's when we started to think, wow, we know some writers. And we were able to get people to commission pieces in yeah. the book as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's, my, <laughs> that's a better verb. <laughs> Yeah, I love that too, the way that um, the final book has come together with voices both ancient and modern. Um, and I think it's very, very powerful and kind of speaks to the continuity, um, the communion that we have with older writers um, and the books of this. The accumulation of the voices gives it a power. Um, I don't think that there's a book like this 
um, that really addresses the Christian writer in a way that we do, that, that gives tools and um, gives expression to what we are. Right. And articulates the community of writers, the writers of faith, who are struggling in the same way, who are, I mean, Augustine living prayers to issues that we ourselves are first. Mm -hmm. 17th century, 16th century, 18th century writers who are going through exactly the same sort of uh, issues and difficulties and joys and pleasures mm -hmm. that we ourselves face today. And there's that sense of the community of writers all the time that I think is very really powerful. Cool. So, the hopes that we have is people will respond exactly that way. Not that you would read through the whole thing necessarily, but that you would go from the book to your own writing. Reading big read. Is that fair? Is that I can't wait to see it in um, published form so that I can put it on my desk and really begin the writing day looking through it. I think that we are heirs of the romantic movement more than the Jewish Christian tradition. Yeah. And so we see writing as self-expression. And that's our God is to express ourselves. Um, I think that there is something deeper than that. I have writing students who their greatest fear, their absolute greatest fear is the writer's block. And it's like this thing that comes over them, this life. And, and they can't move forward and they have no idea how to get past it. And if you use that metaphor that there's this wall there, um, and the only resources I have are those that are in me, and the only resources that I have are now drying up, wow, that's a pretty frightening place to be. Um, so the pre romantic you would never. I mean, that metaphor wouldn't work at all. And the notion that you were just writing on your own with nothing else behind you, it seems to me that you wouldn't be there at all. And we have lost that. You know, maybe it's American individualism, sort of, whatever it is. But it seems to me that there's, there, there are spiritual resources that writers of faith have that we can fall back on. And not, not therefore be frightened that, oh, today I didn't write very well. It must be writer's block. I guess I'll never say anything. Yeah. That doesn't seem to be an option. And I think too, a Christian has um, a sense of service. If, if this is a talent, if this is a gift that God has given to me, then I'm going to use that to the best of my ability to serve God in its kingdom. You know, you know, as in anything in life, you find more success, or more depth of meaning when you leave it in prayer. Um, it resonates more. Yeah, I think anyone. I, I think this book can be anyone who's going to put to create a text. Um, and novelists, of course, poets, dramatists. But today, that that notion of using text is wow, it's just expanded hugely. And so we also now, I think this book could, could apply absolutely to screenwriters, to bloggers, to people who are working in social media, to do serious writing on, on, on social media. Across the board, anyone who's going to put down words to express ideas, I think, could be informed by this book. We have a couple of prayers by Scott Jose, who mm -hmm. is um, at the Center of Excellence in Preaching. And at Calvinson. At Calvinson. I, I guess it would be my open prayer that this volume finds its way into preachers' studies and that they too can find a resource here for inspiration. This is pretty unique. We did try one before and she dumped me. She dumped me from the project, but this is our first one together. We tried to make a picture book together, but we failed. That's true. Yeah, but this one, we had. I don't want to say discrete tasks, but Anne, Anne did a lot of the first search work, um, and that was years. And then I did a lot of the, okay, here's the text, and now where, where did it come from? Kind of thing, because it was so, so often we found that there are many texts out there that have this sort of ethereal, they're just out in the air, but there's different versions, no one knows where they, but often when they're reprinted, there's no source, there's no sourcing. So you're not sure where it is, or who owns it, who actually wrote it. Um, we found wonderful versions of old hymns that had been corrupted in later versions. And the older ones, 
spoke more powerfully to us. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of that work, mm -hmm. um, which was a drudge work. But then we went back and forth. The writing we shared for the intro was a general introduction, five introductions to each, or eight introductions to each piece. And we shared that as well. So it was great. So we had some discrete tasks and some that we shared. It was fun. It was really fun. Um, story first. Story first. If you're going to start on a project, let's say a novel or a short story or something, and your whole intent is, I'm going to present the Beatitudes. Okay, you'll write a book that will present the Beatitudes. But it be, almost certainly allows the story. Um, you begin with the story. And what is it that drives you? You begin with all the elements that any of you get to. Maybe language, and character, and plot, and setting, all the craft elements. And that's what you have to do. If your head is somewhere else, no matter how ethereal and wonderful that is, then you're not doing the story. And given that, it seems to me that if you take it seriously, that because of who you are as a writer, well, all those elements will come out. And it's not something that I think you need to then consciously even, on some level, or immediately say, I want to make sure that, wow, the second beatitude is in this chapter. Um, that will come out because of who you are as a writer. If you don't do that, if it's the flip, you will always present, and Catherine Patterson calls it propaganda, in a good sense, but it's still, I'm going to teach you at this, this thought, and then you're not doing the story. And that's fine, do that, but then don't pretend it's story. So I guess I would say that you always begin with all the elements that any writer speaks with, and who you are as a person of faith will always come out. And that's true, I believe, of anything, a screen plays, and poetry, and drama, and essays, it will always come out. And you know, I mean, you sit and listen to a sermon. How many sermons begin with abstraction and you start to think about the roast that you're going to put on and get home? <laughs> versus the sermon that begins with a dramatic story. Maybe a gospel story or maybe a story that comes from whatever. And story brings us in as human beings. That's how we're wired. We're brought in by stories. And I think any writer has to do that. Okay. I'll take sort of a different track and just <coughs> highlight Walt Langford's prayer that's in here, and I think it is so beautiful because it expresses the temptation to make writing a fire. And we need to be really vigilant that we are faithful and that we offer our gifts to the service of God instead of wanting to pursue publication as God. Um, and, and so to, to offer our gifts and not to do this for our own glory. So that takes, you know, that's the role of prayer, is it? Self examination. And why am I doing this anyway? Am I sincere about my desires?